He teaches at the University of Florida and is the author of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the American Environmental Century. Um, and as most of you probably know, uh, The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea, which received the Pulitzer Prize two years ago. Um, and as I uh, had the chance to ask him a while ago, I'm, I guess that much of the work on these two books is kind of what led him to the his two previous books is what led him to uh, The Bald Eagle, The Improbable Journey of America's Bird, uh, published by Literai, which, as I was also saying, is a, a subsidiary of Norton and uh, one of the great publishing imprints uh, in our country and has been for a long time. Um, and in this book, you'll learn much about our national bird, uh, how it became the national bird. Uh, what kind of bird the eagle really is. Uh, many of us have never seen one. I know there's uh, several in this room who have, many of them, uh, how it neared extinction and how it was rescued and how, like our nation, it can be at times um, a mighty uh, and dominant, but also exposed and really fragile. Um, the book is fascinating and it's also a lot of fun. And I agree with one of the blurbs uh, Marvelous, you'll never look at the back of a 25 cent piece the same way again. <laughs> uh, so, thank you, Jack, for coming today. And I wanted to, uh, he's, a, he's a fan of another uh, great writer, uh, E.O. Wilson, also from Alabama, who recently uh, died. And we were talking about this long ago, and he hadn't had a chance to get to it yet. So, we're presenting you. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Welcome. Thank you for, for coming out. Um, and uh, pleasure to be here, although I didn't know I was coming to snow country. <laughs> and I was uh, down on the coast earlier this week and uh, uh, terribly underdressed for, for this weather. And uh, in fact, I had to borrow a Actually, well, I was given a jacket by a friend from Jackson, uh, where I was uh, just a few hours ago and last night. And, uh, but it's good to see the sun shining uh, and uh, not the snow falling. The, uh, what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the book and the Bald Eagle story and then I'll read to you a, a few paragraphs and uh, some paragraphs that focus on Mississippi, as a matter of fact, uh, which has an interesting history in, uh, in the Bald Eagle biography. And, uh, and then of course, take uh, questions from the judges. I also take complaints as well. <laughs> the, uh, so I, people always ask me, why and why did I uh, write this book? And there are a number, number of reasons. One, when I finished the Gulf of Mexico, I don't know where the idea came from uh, that, you know, some, something, a thought came in my head, write a book about the Bald Eagle. And I thought, oh gosh, that's a great idea. So I looked to see if, if a cultural and natural history had been written under the Bald Eagle in, in recent years. Of course, there are all sorts of uh, coffee table photograph uh, books of the Bald Eagle. There are tons of children's books about Bald Eagles. But the last book that, and there are a number of uh, books that scientists have written on the Bald Eagle, but the, uh, not a cultural and natural history of the Bald Eagle since 1996. A, a really wonderful book written by uh, Bruce Beans uh, titled Eagle's Plume. But uh, Beans focuses more on the restoration of the Bald Eagle population after DDT. Uh, and he doesn't go as deep into the history that I wanted to do, the historical relationship uh, between the Bald Eagle and the American people as I wanted to. So I saw a need there, but I also wanted to write and as an environmental writer, I wanted to write a different a story with a, a, a different sort of tone than that we're accustomed to encountering in books on the environment that, you know, tend to, they tended to focus on the, the, uh, the grim and the tragic. And I thought readers deserved a, a break from that and, and uh, perhaps wanted, uh, would, would appreciate a more uplifting story that might provide some sort of positive reinforcement as we uh, confront environmental challenges of, of the 21st century. And the bald eagle story is, is a great American conservation success story. Not that there isn't the grim and the tragic, and it's, 
historic relationship with, with the American people. Um, but uh, we pushed it to the brink of extinction in the lower 48 states twice, but we also redeemed ourselves twice. And, uh, and today the bald legal population is thriving. Continent wide, it is probably around 500,000, uh, and which is equivalent to the estimated size of the population at the time that Europeans began settling uh, the continent. Uh, now, let me put that in perspective. In 1963, when the National Audubon led a, uh, a ball legal nest count, um, the, the total for the lower 48 states, again, in 1963, a year after Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, uh, was uh, 487. And the bald eagle was missing in action from uh, a lot of states. No New England state except outside of Maine had any nesting bald eagles. Uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, uh, uh, Ohio, uh, uh, Indiana, no nesting bald eagles. Uh, across the South, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, no nesting bald eagles. Uh, the Carolina is sporadically one or two in some years, none in other years. Louisiana, you know, a state with a lot of water, obviously, uh, and a lot of fish, or you would think fish, but again, this is you know, still uh, early post DDT and uh, the, or the, right in the middle of DD, DDT, excuse me, uh, only three or four nesting pairs in the northern part of the state. Florida had, of the southern states had the healthiest population, um, but it, but only about 88 nesting pairs, where is uh, a couple of decades earlier, there were 1,500 to 2,000 nesting pairs. And so it's the, the, again, it's this great American conservation success story. Uh, and, uh, and so I wanted to write about that success story, but when I got into the history, I learned that DDT wasn't the only time we pushed bald eagles to the brink of extinction. Um, we did so in the late 19th and early 20th century. And the assault on the bald eagles then was not indirect. They were not collateral damage of some uh, chemical pesticide uh, and such as DDT. Um, but it was a direct assault. Americans were shooting bald eagles out of the sky every opportunity they had. The bald eagle became a national symbol in 1782 when Congress adopted it for the, uh, the national seal of the great seal of the United States. It was actually a really good pick. It took Congress, by the way, uh, three committees, uh, 14, 15 uh, uh, congressional delegates, consultants and artists before they finally happened upon a design for a national seal that was uh, that uh, Congress uh, uh, liked and would, could accept. Uh, the uh, eagles were, a bald eagle was not put on or suggested for the seal until the end of those six years in 1782. And, um, and it was an ideal pick for that, I think, for the great seal of the United States. Charles Thompson, the secretary of the Continental Congress was essentially the most powerful man in uh, that institutional body. Uh, was the one who said, let's put the bald eagle on the seal. He was fed up with all these committees failing. Um, and I should say the very first seal committee that was organized just within hours of Congress uh, voting to accept the, the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. The first seal committee, committee uh, was Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams. Stellar group, right? You, I mean, you have to, I forgot, am I on camera? You're fine, I, I you're good. I walk okay, sorry for that. No worries. But you would think, oh, who, who, you know, Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams, of course they're gonna come up with the best seal in the world, right? These guys failed miserably. Uh, I tell them the whole story in the book. Uh, and you would, won't believe what they wanted on the great seal. Uh, and, uh, but Thompson said, finally said, okay, fed up with these idiots. Nobody can come up with a decent seal. We're going to put the bald eagle on. And he wanted, his instruction said, an American bald eagle. Now, eagles on uh, uh, nation state 
coats of arms and seals go back to the ancient Greeks and, and Romans. Uh, but the, all those eagles on, on uh, you know, in heraldry are non-ornithological. They don't represent any particular species. But the eagle that went on, the Great Seal of the United States, was a recognizable species, the bald eagle, um, with its white head, white tail, uh, dark body. Uh, and, uh, but also the bald eagle, and the other reason that it was ideal is because it's, it's, it only lives, only uh, nests in North America. It only lives in the wild in North America. So it's truly an all-American bird. And the United States at the time was um, uh, really um, eager to assert its own identity uh, separate of European influences. And so it has this bald eagle. It doesn't have like Great Britain has a lion that doesn't even live, live in Great Britain and a unicorn. <laughs> Yeah, I guess they live in Great Britain, right? right. Uh, and uh, and so uh, it was ideal, but also um, the bald eagle has this uh, super orbital ridge or bone uh, uh, above its eyes that gives it that perfect "don't tread on me" stare. Uh, and it's a bird that's charismatic; it conveys courage, sovereignty, or independence. Uh, and, and strength. So how, you know, how could anything be more ideal for a young nation? Now, the bald eagle didn't appear on a lot of, in a lot of decorative arts before the Great Seal. Uh, you didn't see it on um, uh, national um, or governmental insignia uh, or um, hardly anywhere. But it became the image of the bald eagle became instantly popular after 1782 when the Great Seal was adopted. Americans loved it. They started putting it on everything. Uh, of course, uh, all sorts of government insignia, but uh, business logos, uh, eventually a sports team uh, uniform. Uh, eagle is the most popular, um, the most popular. Uh, animal mascot for sports teams in, in America, um, even more popular um, than the duck and the beaver, uh, and or even the gator. <laughs> and it, um, uh, uh, it's how many? Did anybody anybody in here ever own an AMC Eagle? Oh, okay. <laughs> there a car that did not live up to its name. <laughs> Um, and you know it's on uh, car Goodyear tires. They still have eagle tires. Been around for a long time. The back of motorcycle jackets, of course, extreme, extremely popular. But while the image was popular, the bird itself was not. The species Americans treated it's an apex predator, and they treated it like they did any other uh, apex, you know, like a, like a wolf, a coyote, uh, a um, uh, a bear, or a mountain lion. A, Bald eagle scene was a bald eagle to be shot. It was accused of all, falsely accused of all kinds of crimes, of, of, of stealing livestock that was far too heavy for it to carry away. Calves and pigs and uh, sheep, uh, chickens, chickens, uh, uh, a bald eagle can carry away. I interviewed a free range chicken farmer in, in Georgia who called his chickens uh, low hanging fruit because uh, his, um, when he went into the free range business, free range chicken business, bald eagles started, started suddenly started showing up uh, around his, his farm and, and taking them. And, um, but they were also, mothers were warned, and ornithologists are saying this too. Um, mothers were warned, don't leave your infant outside unattended unless you want a bald eagle to carry it away back to its nest. And McGuffey's Reader, which was next to the Bible, was the most read book in the 19th century, a primer for immigrants who are wanting to learn English and for school children, uh, had a story for many decades of, uh, of a young girl uh, stolen away by a bald eagle, uh, taken back to its nest, and the and, you know, towns, people rise up to try to save the girl. And one of the, uh, a 1908 silent film 
um, produced by Edison Studios, that's Thomas Edison, um, uh, titled uh, uh, Rescue from an Eagle's Nest, um, was uh, in fact perpetuated that myth. Uh, and the story opens with the, uh, a, a man and his wife and child, a lumberjack and his wife and child, living out in the woods in a log cabin. Uh, in the opening scene, he kisses his, his wife and daughter goodbye, uh, skips off with his axe on her shoulder uh, to do his job, and the mother uh, goes back in the cabin and leaves the child outside to play. And suddenly you see, and you can, you know, it's silent film. You, you can see it on YouTube, by the way, uh, but there's no sound. But you can hear, you see the, uh, the steagle fly behind the cabin. Uh, on wires, on these wings that move like this on these wires. You can hear, even though it was, you don't hear the recording on YouTube, you can hear the organ in the orchestra pit uh, rising. Uh, it's really uh, threatening. And then this eagle swoops in, grabs a baby who has her own wires, and flies off with it. Uh, these are in the days before child actors had any sort of protection. And, <laughs> the, and she's crying. And she, she's not acting, she's, she's literally crying. And, uh, and so ultimately, the mother realizes what's happened. She runs off and gets her husband, uh, not before running back to the cabin to get her hat uh, and, uh, and gets her husband. And he runs over to this uh, cliff and looks down to the sledge where the eagle's nest is. And there's his baby. He climbs down, uh, gets in a scuffle with the, uh, the eagle uh, and uh, more. Uh, special effects of the day, a club instantly appears in his hand, in his empty hand, and he beats the, uh, the bald eagle and kicks it over the ledge and celebrates, saves his girl. And the actor who was playing the father was none other than B.W. Griffith, who, of course, went on to make in 1915, The Birth of a Nation, uh, the film that, that um, resurrected the, the, the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, critics reviewing Rescue from an Eagle's Nest panned him as an actor. And so he stopped acting after that and went into directing. <clears throat> so you have to wonder if the critics have had a different opinion if, if we would have ever had The Birth of a Nation. But Americans uh, by this time were worried that the bald eagle might go the way of the passenger pigeon, the last one died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo and the Carolina parakeet, the last one died in 1918, also in the Cincinnati Zoo. So don't go live in the Cincinnati Zoo. <laughs> uh, and uh, but America, many Americans are worried they were going to lose, you know, the living bird behind their, the symbol of their nation. Uh, and so they began lobbying for the protection of the bald eagle. It was, at the same time, the territory of Alaska in 1917 adopts a bald eagle bounty, um, uh, which continues until 1952. And during that period, accusing bald eagle of being uh, economic competition for salmon fishermen. Um, bald eagles tend, tend to uh, feed on spawned out salmon, which are no good for the market. Uh, but between 1917 and 1952, Alaska paid bounties on over 128,000 bald eagles. And when I was doing my research, uh, on newspapers.com, which is a great da uh, database for thousands of, of, of local dailies and, and weekly newspapers in the United States, dating back to the colonial period. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I searched, did a search from 1850 to 1920 with three words in quotation marks, bald eagle shot. And I came up with, with uh, over 140,000 hits uh, and between 1850 and 1920. Um, and uh, so our, you know, we hear about the slaughter of the bison, but we don't hear about the slaughter of the American slaughter of the bald eagle. Um, but I mentioned earlier that we redeemed ourselves. Um, there were people who organized to um, uh, try to protect the bald eagle. Eventually, despite National Audubon, which would not uh, take a stand in support of the bald eagle or take a stand against the uh, Alaska bounty, um, the, uh, a number of people rose up, uh, wrote 
newspaper article is a woman by the name of Rosalie Edge, who was fed up with National Audubon, started her own, own organization, the Emergency Conservation Committee, uh, outing National Audubon, uh, and who had a which had a cozy uh, relationship with uh, ammunition companies in, the, in those days. And uh, eventually they were able to get Congress to pass the Bald Eagle Protection Act in 1940, a year before America went to war against fascist tyranny. Um, Congress recognized that if they lost the bald eagle, it would have undermined the integrity of that, of that, that really well-known symbol, uh, a symbol of freedom. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, and, and democracy and, and inequality. Uh, yet the bald eagle had been denied those very things throughout the 19th century on into the early 20th century. But then five years later, after Congress passed that, passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, which by the way, I might mention, was the first uh, federal law that gave uh, protection to an individual species. Uh, and all the federal uh, protections um, uh, for uh, species before then, or laws before then covered multiple species, but Bald Eagle got its own law. But five years after it was passed, BDT goes on the, is released on the general market and it saturates the country. Uh, and the bald eagle population, nesting population, uh, you could see in the 1950s, those who were uh, intimately familiar with the bald eagle and studied the bald eagle saw their population just take this precipitous dive in the 1950s. Uh, and uh, finally, in the United States, and not just the bald eagle, osprey, other raptors, birds, all sorts of bird species were suffering fish species. Fish are the primary food of bald eagles. They will, they will eat uh, birds, they'll eat land animals, but they prefer fish. Uh, and they, they nest within uh, just a, a hundred or so yards within, within a body of water. And, uh, and so they, uh, they were um, again pushed to the brink of extinction in, in the lower 48. In 19, 1972 was a pivotal year uh, for uh, American environmentalism, but also uh, the bald eagle. Congress uh, uh, increased the penalty for harming a bald eagle, eagle under the Bald Eagle Protection Act. Um, it also, um, it also um, ban, uh, banned, the, or at least uh, the EPA banned the sale of DDT. Uh, and uh, and it, it also passed the Congress passed the Clean Water Act. So you can have all those protections. By the way, it's the 50th anniversary this year of Clean Water Act this October. You could have Bald Eagle could have all these protections. Have the Bald Eagle Protection Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which it, in, it which it was finally included under all, again in 1972, uh, and it could um, have. Um, the, the Endangered Species Act protecting it, which was uh, passed in 1973, but without cleaning up its watery habitat, it would not have been able to come back. Uh, and we cleaned up uh, dirty waters across the, across the country, uh, aquatic life, uh, plant life came back, fish came back, birds came back, uh, including the osprey uh, and the brown pelican. Uh, all the, the, the brown pelican, the bald eagle, and the osprey all disappeared from the northern Gulf by the 1960s. Um, but in 1970, all these states that I mentioned earlier have no nesting population. 72, DDT is finally banned. Four years later, uh, Fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife launches a restoration program in the bicentennial year, 1976, uh, across the country. Uh, and essentially, the way that worked is they I mentioned that New England states had no nesting eagles with the exception of Maine. And so they, they would bring in uh, eaglets from healthy areas such as Northern Michigan, Wisconsin, Alaska, and Canada, and raise them in these, these big, I call them lion cages, outdoor lion cages on top of stilts uh, in the elements. And five to six weeks old, they were taken from the nest, moved them to say Massachusetts or New York or or Pennsylvania, raise them in what were called hack boxes and with makeshift nests in them, feed them 
from behind blind. And at 12 weeks, when they fledge, let them go. But while they're living in those boxes, they imprint on the territory. And, and so the territory that they imprint on becomes, in their minds, their natal territory. In bald eagles, return to the, when they reach breeding age at four to five years, return to their natal territory to mate and to build nests and to, um, um, and to live the rest of their life, uh, and generally. And it was huge success across the North these hacking programs. And now the South was a different challenge. Uh, there are, some people call them subspecies. They're Northern bald eagles, they're Southern bald eagles. It could just be different gene pools, but the Northern bald eagles are larger than the Southern bald eagles. And the Northern bald eagles can't take the heat in the South. They're also not immune to an avian malaria that the Southern bald eagles are, are immune to. So they couldn't bring down Michigan bald eagles to the South uh, and um, put them and raise them in hack boxes or Canadian. They needed a regional bald eagle. And all these Southern states are depleted of nesting eagles. With the exception of Florida by 1970 had about 300 nesting pairs. And, but that wasn't enough uh, to remove eaglets and put them in uh, you know, the, the other Southern states. There was a concern that would harm the popul nesting population in Florida. So the, um, the, um, the Sutton Avian Center in Oklahoma came up with that idea. Let's take eggs out of the nest of Florida birds, bring them up to Oklahoma, incubate and hatch them underneath hens, raise them until they're five, six weeks old, and then move them into hack boxes in the Southern states, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, the Carolinas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. And that's what exactly what they did. And over the course of four years in the 1980s, Florida bald eagles donated 275 eggs uh, to this program, this egg uh, translocation and hacking program. And uh, the hatch rate was 100 uh, uh, was 100% uh, uh, complete success. Uh, and so now today, when you see a nesting bald eagle in Mississippi or some other Southern state, there's a good chance that it's a descendant of Florida bald eagles. Now the Florida bald eagles didn't suffer because uh, what they did, that wildlife officials did, is they went in, they took all the eggs that were in an eagle's nest soon after they were laid. And they're generally two, uh, sometimes just one, uh, sometimes three, but they would empty the nest completely and they would do it early on, so the female would lay it a second clutch. Uh, and so the Florida bald eagles didn't lose population. Uh, yet Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and all those others got population. Uh, and so, and that's so that's what I want to read. Uh, I want to read about that. I want to read a little bit about the uh, the Mississippi story, a part in the in this in this larger story. But I also, before I do that, I also want to. We can credit wildlife officials, our own changing environmental sensibilities, our willingness to live with bald eagles to uh, the, the success of their comeback uh, and, and also this restoration program. But we also have to give credit to bald eagles themselves. Uh, they, are, they, have, they have the ideal family values, if you will. They uh, mate for life. Uh, they maintain a fidelity to their nests. For life, as long as that nest exists, it doesn't get blown down in a storm, uh, or some somebody comes along and cuts down the nest tree, which is a violation of federal law. Um, they will maintain a loyalty to that nest. Uh, they return to it every year, uh, and they add on to it. Uh, they can get quite large. One scientist in the 1920s in Ohio measured a nest that was 10 feet across and 12 feet deep, and it came down it was in an old hickory came down in a storm, uh, and when he estimated the weight, uh, he came up with uh, between one and two tons. So that old hickory is obviously saying, okay, enough is enough. <laughs> I've had you for 35 years. I can't handle this anymore. I'm getting too big for me. Uh, and that, so nests can last that long. They can last, last 35, 40 years. Uh, the, the, the bald eagle couple also raise their young with such care, feed them so well that when they leave the nest, 
uh, they uh, they often weigh more than their parents. Um, so what I, I'm going to open up and talk, um, read a few paragraphs about the mating ritual of, of bald eagles, which was uh, among the most spectacular in uh, among wildlife. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to uh, the uh, little bit about uh, Mississippi. I guess if I stand over here. In the wild, a bald eagle couple is coming together to foster a next generation is an event we associate with a renewal of life born from the mysterious force of instinct. But the bald eagle's courtship ritual, its grace and in, in elaborateness, the emotion evident in the performance, reveals something else deep within two eagles, which intend to be a pair for life. The ritual starts from a perch or in the air with one eagle calling loudly to a potential mate. If interest exists, the two will meet in flight. A fleet chase typically ensues with pursuer and pursued exchanging positions, each barrel rolling and scissoring their flight paths, or with one flying upside down beneath the other. Sometimes the two will clench talons together and roll horizontally through the rushing air. One might break away and turn into a deep, steep ascent, slow its wing beat, and let gravity pull it into a stall, pitching over and down. With wings folded back, the eagle drops into a hurrying dive. Then at the last minute before disaster, it soars upward into another ascent, following the first maneuver with another rushing dive and another ascent over and over again in undulating flight. Even more heart stirring and heart stopping is yet another performance, the cartwheel display, a veritable aerial waltz. Two talon feet, sometimes all four, join and become an axis between whirling, somersaulting, pinwheeling eagles, a suspended avian cyclone. Laws of motion pull the courting pair outward. Desire holds them together. They de defy separation and falling together, death. The release happens moments before the bonded two turn up and away from the water or ground. That death-defying ritual long ago stirred a poem from Walt Whitman, one of his later ones titled, The Dalliance of the Eagles. 10 lines long and included in Leaves of Grass, the poem become, became one of Whitman's most beloved. Now I'm gonna recite the poem for you. Skirting the river road, my forenoon walk, my rest, skyward in air, a sudden muffled sound, the dalliance of the eagles. The rushing amorous contact, high in space together, the clenching interlocking claws, a living fierce gyrating wheel. Four beating wings, two beaks, a swirling mass tight, grappling. In tumbling, turning, clustering loops, straight forward, downward, falling, till over the river poised the twain yet one, a moment's lull. A motionless still balance in the air, the parting, talons loosening. Upward again on slow, firm pinions, slanting, their separate, diverse flight. She hers, he his, pursuing. Shift to the southeast and for a moment back to the early days of DDT, the town of Ocean Springs on the Mississippi Gulf of Mexico coast got a pair of eagles in 1951. They were adults and came not from a restoration initiative, but from the imagination of an artist. Walter Anderson, who lived in Ocean Springs and had studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the fountainhead of the Schoolkill River School, was the artist. He painted not landscapes so much as individual living things of nature, almost exclusively those of the Gulf Coast. If one had to attach him to a movement, he came closest to express expressionism, influenced by what he realized emotionally, aesthetically, and intellectually from his subjects. When town officials decided to spruce up the 2,500 square foot community center, Anderson volunteered to paint a mural for the nominal sum of one dollar. 
The mural ultimately covered all 250 feet of the community center's four walls, from floor to ceiling, and its doors and door trim. On one wall, he depicted the Aboriginal peoples of the coast. On another, the French arriving to settle it in the 17th century. He devoted the rest to the cosmos, what he called the seven climates, and to Gulf Coast nature. Among the latter was the dalliance of two eagles. A reader Whitman, Anderson shared the poet's sensibilities of nature. Mr. Whitman, he once wrote to himself, be my aid, friend of the wind I am. Anderson spent weeks at a time alone on the wind cliff barrier islands off Mississippi and Louisiana. Each was unpeopled, yet none was a deserted island. They were exuberant sovereignties of crawling, stalking, burrowing, and flying beings. They were fascination and inspiration. Anderson called himself a privileged spectator of all the living that happened on the island. On Horn Island, an eight mile row or sail out from Ocean Springs, in a skiff of some uncertain seaworthiness, he had witnessed the mating ceremony of the American bird and referred to the sight of it as a regal gift. Horn was a 10 by three quarter mile dune hump sand spit giving residency to assorted vegetation, including a grove of pine trees. It had nesting pelicans, ospreys, and eagles, to name just a few species. In the 1950s, Anderson noticed that the presence of those birds was falling off. The last pair of nesting eagles in the area had been seen in 1940 on Ship Island, 18 miles west of Horn. By the 1960s, pelicans, ospreys, and eagles had disappeared altogether. Anderson suspected chemical pollution traveling down gulf-bound rivers. He was right. He was witnessing the shock of DDT. Anderson died of complications related to cancer surgery in 1965, just months after Hurricane Betsy, a category four crusher, uh, trained his destructive eye on the Horn Island. 20 years later and six months later, 20 years and six months later, Horn was once again a dwelling place for bald eagles. Its new feathered residents came courtesy of the George Sutton Avian Research Center in Oklahoma. A number of unsuspecting donor eagles in Florida and squirts of superglue. So if you want to know what role superglue played in this restoration, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> you'll have to support your independent Bookstore. <laughs> so, thank you. I can take questions if you have any. Really, you learn that much? <laughs> no questions? I can, I'll pose the question I okay. asked you a while ago to these people. Okay. About, you know, my wife and I have watched birds in North Mississippi for years. Mm -hmm. We would see as many as 15, 20 bald eagles at Sardis over the winter time and start <coughs> eating it in one day. Mm -hmm. And we were told that those bald eagles were coming from the north. So a while ago, I asked Jack the question was that true? Or were we getting the influx of bald eagles from the south? This was in, this is like the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. 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 So, uh, the my, bald, bald eagles will, uh, for the most part, uh, after breeding season, will leave their their natal territory and migrate somewhere. And there's no consistent migration pattern to um, to bald eagles. Um, the like like there are a lot of migrating birds. Northern bald eagles generally fly, fly southward. Some will go below the Mason-Dixon line. Some don't don't want anything to do with going below the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, and uh, the, the southern bald eagles will fly north. Some will not go above the Mason-Dixon line. Some will go as far as Canada. Horn Island, uh, or, uh, the, the Horn Island birds that were raised in the hack boxes, may, and many of them went up to the Great Lakes region, some even as far as Canada. Some of the Florida eagles go as far as Canada. So what you can see here between breeding seasons uh, is both um, a common, it could be a combination of some northern, some southern bald eagles. Um, there are a lot of, there are a number of Florida bald eagles that they go to real foot, foot 
uh, lake or national wildlife refuge. Uh, and so you could be getting some of those or you could have been getting some of those uh, uh, back in the 80s and in, in, in the 90s. So it's, it's hard to say where, where they're coming from. Uh, again, it could be a mix of Southern and Northern uh, and it could be a, a number of Mississippi birds that just don't want to go that far. So after, after the hacking? After the hacking? After the uh, hacking. Yeah, so you may have gotten you may have gotten some some birds from Horn Island yeah, well, during the hacking. Saw, we never saw twenty acres. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, they started nesting right all over, and the only eagles we really see now are probably local birds. Except between breeding season, you may be seeing birds from elsewhere. Right, right. and uh, but what you'll see during nesting season, the juveniles. Um, before, okay, so they are in Mississippi now in this part. Uh, you've got uh, you've got um, eaglets in the nest. Uh, they probably won't fledge for you know maybe another week or two. Uh, and but you'll see some um, uh, some large adult size immatures in the area. They don't have their white tail feathers or their white uh, white head feathers yet, but they'll have a mix. Uh, they they look sort of variegated or mottled with uh, like a, a chocolate brown and uh, white spots on them. Those are more than likely birds who came from nests here in the past years, and they so they have um, so they're hanging out because they remember the food they got when they when they were being raised in the nest. And the parents, as I said, feed them well. And once they reach that five six weeks of age. The parents leave the nest to give them room to grow and to exercise. They use their nest like a gymnasium. They bounce up and down, exercise the wings, and the parents get out of the way, but they continue to bring food to them, uh, to the nest. And even after they fledge, they still come back to the nest because the parents are still bringing food to the nest and leaving it for them uh, until it's time for everybody to, 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 to migrate, everybody to leave. Jack? Yeah. Yes. I got a question. <coughs> the other day I was down in the Delta. We were shooting a pair of eagles with their two new babies. Mm -hmm. Little, little bitty babies. And as we watched What them, what color were they? Were they were they fluffy whitish gray? Fluffy white. Okay, gray, so yeah. they're yeah. They were paired to So they're still in their natal feathers. Yeah. Uh, so one or the other kept going and getting meat to bring it back and feed them and all that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they went over and proceeded to cohabitate. Could that mother have another set of eggs? They went over where? On a limb. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then they went yeah. The tree. Well, what the parents will do is they'll they'll branch. Uh, to to um, if once their 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 eagles are starting to get a larger. They'll they'll hang out in a tree. That's where they'll 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 stay in a branch. Uh, it's not, it's unlikely that if that that the, the female would have another brood in another nest. Oh, we were curious. We didn't know. Yeah. Now sometimes they will have they will build two nests. They will build a backup nest in case they lose one. Um, but uh, I'm not aware of, of bald eagles um, having you know two active nests. You know, with a brood, with the brood in each. But what they do is they do, they leave, they give them room. Once they get large enough and they're, they're, they're no longer at risk of being uh, preyed upon by owls, for instance, or hawks, uh, the parents will leave them alone and they'll go branch. So they'll even spend the night in, in the trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So this is a question from someone tuning in on Facebook. Okay. Um, they'd like to know, is there a difference between Atlantic bald eagles and those on the West Coast? No, kind of just, like just Northern, Southern, and, and, and again, and it's only, it's only the size that's um, the difference and, uh, between the Northern and Southern. Uh, they generally do not fly, do not migrate East and West, or maybe, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I apologize, <coughs> excuse me. There may be a little bit of east-west lateral movement, but it's it's typically north and south that they they, they migrate. Um, now on the west coast, between breeding seasons, they can see their Alaska bald eagles will come down to Washington and Oregon, northern California, 
Uh, and there are a couple of knuckleheads that go all the way down to New Mexico. Nobody knows why they make that long flight. Uh, they, a lot of Alaskan bald eagles go um, out to, to the Aleutian Islands in, in uh, you know, late spring and summer. Uh, and Saskatchewan bald eagles will, will fly down to Colorado. Colorado bald eagles will fly up to Saskatchewan um, between breeding season. And so they're more or less swapping um, places. Um, it's, it's, it's a totally random, uh, their, their migration patterns. I mean, there may be something less random out, but, but science can't, can't explain them. What we see is randomness. There was a, yes, in the back. Paul Roth is at the lake. And, you know, and perhaps you touched on this and I apologize if you have, but I keep hearing you say the word NATO. Um, a natal, N-A-T-A-L, natal, yeah. Okay, I thought we had natal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Okay. Any other question is, uh, what is the, how old, what is the lifespan of an eagle? So in the wild, um, they can live late 30s, 40s. The oldest one we're aware of uh, to live in the wild um, was hit by a car uh, when it was 38 years old. Uh, and now in captivity, they, uh, some have been known to live to be 40, early 40s. And uh, so it's so not a bad lifespan. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Have you ever seen any of you surfing in the nest uh, in the east? No, have you? Yeah. Oh, you mean taking over an eagle's nest? Yeah. While eagles were in it? Yeah. Or Really? Yeah. Is that right? When I was in, uh, I think it was uh, around Yellowstone. Hmm. We were looking for a bald eagle for a state bird. So when I stopped one of the people that were working there and I said, where are you bald eagles? He said, well, two weeks ago, there was, was a pair in the nest up the river, but the Kandagese had taken over. That seems odd. I, I, yeah. I, 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 wonder if the ball, I wonder if the couple had actually abandoned the nest. And oh, no, I've seen it right here. here. I've seen it right here in, in Mississippi. I've seen it right out here in Starbucks. You, you've seen... Uh, bald, eagles, bald eagles have built, built the nest and they'd used the nest the year before. Yeah. So the preceding year, uh, we went out there and there was a bald, there was a geese in there. You mean the, 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 the next year? Correct. Okay. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that more than likely the bald eagle couple abandoned the nest uh, because they, I can't imagine a bald eagle allowing uh, Canada geese to uh, force them out of their nest. Well, you know the guy that uh, monitors the bald eagles over there well, on this little stretch off the Mississippi River, there's three bald eagles nests there. And the original bald eagles nest was used for a couple of years, and then the geese took it over. So the bald eagles built another nest 100 yards from it. So the next year, the geese got in the new nest, and the bald eagles went back to the other nest. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of you know a, another bird forcing a bald eagle out of well, its course, territory. Of course, you know, there was no Kansas geese around this city. Right, right. Yeah, I know. I know. I've known well, the Kansas geese brought them in here because they were having problems, yeah. you know, up north in yeah. the airport and stuff. So that's where all this. Started. It's it's hard. It's hard for me to imagine that eagles would be chased out of their own nest by Kansas geese. You're talking about geese running an eagle out. It's like the contents of your refrigerator taking over your house. The geese would be suffer for the eagles putting it. Uh, well, that's no, yeah. The, the bald eagles are not going to bother the geese. Why? Well, I think they're pretty docile. I don't, I don't think they will. The, who, who's docile? The bald eagles? Yeah. Oh no. I would, I would, oh no. no, they're very, very territorial. Uh, <laughs> and um, they, but, they, but they, they be the same what you said. It may be that not the year that the bald eagles are using it. <laughs> But after they leave the nest, whatever. Yeah, no, yeah. The other birds, I mean, uh, around the raptors, ospreys will move into bald eagle's nest as long as it's been abandoned uh, by the voluntarily by the bald eagles. Uh, and not, and, but they they're very territorial. They're they're fierce birds, and you know they they steal uh, food from other birds. Uh, they don't tolerate. Um, they I can't imagine them tolerating. They're going to eat a geese. They're going to attack a geese. Uh, and um, I don't know why it wouldn't bother after the geese were, were there. If, 
Well, I, I, I don't know. They, I, you know, it's, it's not, it's not within the bald eagle's behavior to allow another bird to push it out of its nest. Now, why there's their geese are in there in, in an eagle's nest, I'm not sure. Uh, now, they will tolerate other birds in their toler uh, in their territory as long as they're birds that they don't feel threatened by or feel as though they would be uh, competitors for food. Uh, and geese are not, you know, would not be competitors for food. An osprey would be, and they'll chase an osprey away, um, a nesting pair. They'll chase another bald eagle pair out away. They fight over food in midair. I've seen um, bald eagles, I've seen one bald eagle catch a fish, another one attack it in the air and they engage in this aerial battle and the, the fish go, went back and forth between them five times. Um, and uh, they're, they're fierce birds. They, they don't tolerate very much. And uh, so what, uh, yes. I, um, I have a question about the process you use to wipe your birds. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working my way towards the end of the goal, and thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, thank you. It it uh, is impressing me with just how much research goes into this effort that you do. Um, it, it's just amazing to me how, and I'm interested to hear about your process for writing and researching. You have a a phalanx of graduate students. I uh, wish. Surrounding <laughs> us data, or are you traveling a lot? Like, can you say a little bit about that? Um, so uh, the way the way I approach uh, writing a book is I I'll do preliminary research so I can pull together a book proposal to hand over to my agent, who will then you know try to sell it, uh, and it would also help you know get the get the proposal and in good shape uh, for it to be presented. Uh, and then when I uh, sit down to write the book itself, I typically focus on one chapter at a time. So I'll be doing additional research as I'm writing. Uh, and there's, um, you know, there's so much on the internet now in terms of primary sources and, and secondary sources, so much in the archive, so much archival material has been digitized. And so you can just get it at your fingertips. We don't have to go when I wrote a, a book on when I wrote a book on Natchez in the 1990s, I spent six months in the the uh, Mississippi State Archives reading every issue of the Natchez Democrat mm -hmm. on microfilm. We don't have to do that anymore. We can do that right there at our desks. Uh, so you don't have to spend as much time in the archives and libraries as, as you once did. And uh, again, so much you can access online. And I like having a, a loose outline for my chapters. I don't like a rigid detailed outline because I want the history to show me how it wants to be written. I, when I get up in the morning to write, I'm a morning writer. I get up in the morning to write. I want the, uh, I, 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 I have a, you know, an idea of where I want to start and where I'm going to go, but I allow myself to be redirected if something just suddenly crops up or something, there's a surprise that crops up in, in the documents. Uh, you know, somebody I didn't know about. So there are these plot twists, if you will, that happen as I'm, I'm writing, um, which makes it exciting for me. And um, um, so, uh, and, 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 then, and, and again, I, 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 you know, there are a lot of fiction writers who say they want their characters to sh show them how they want the story written. And I'm the same way. I, I want the history to show me how it wants to be written. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you, yeah. when you wrote the Gulf, did you do a lot of travel? I did, I, I did two uh, trips around the Gulf of Mexico, but I did a lot of research just right there on the computer, even more with this because I was researching writing this during COVID. And yeah. so my, I, fortunately, I didn't need anything from the Library of Congress because it was closed down the whole time. And, but what I needed was actually online. It had been digitized, which was, which was great. Google Books is a fantastic uh, uh, source. There's all kinds of old uh, magazines and obviously books uh, in full text on, on Google Books that at one time you had to go to the Library of Congress or an archive or uh, a library to, uh, uh, to you know, get access to. But now it's right there. Newspapers.com, I mentioned. 
fantastic database. Um, and uh, ProQuest, historic uh, newspaper, same, same thing. And uh, just all sorts of government documents online. It's great. Um, so there wasn't a lot of traveling. What I do like to do is I like to go to places that I'm writing about and to visit them and get a sense of what those places are like. And so when I go back home and write, I, I have that in my head. I have this, I have, um, you know, a five, uh, you know, uh, an experience for, through the five senses of a, of a place. And I, and I hope that in some way it finds its way, that experience, uh, you know, that sensorial experience finds its way into my writing. Anything else? Yes. Jack, I'm curious about uh, your knowledge of avian life before you started writing this book. Did you already have a, a broad interest and in knowledge about, about birds? No, I, I mean, I, I had an interest in birds, but I didn't have a broad knowledge. Uh, I still don't have a broad knowledge about birds. I, you know, I have a, not obviously a knowledge of bald eagles. I, I wouldn't call myself a birder uh, and uh, but as, as much as I like birds and I, birds and I observe them, but um, no, I learned an awful lot as, as I, about bird life and uh, obviously bald eagles as I, as I was writing this book. I, and when I wrote the Gulf, I didn't, you know, I grew up on the Gulf. I have this lifelong intimate relationship with it, but I, you know, I, I didn't know a lot about the history of the Gulf and uh, I, I learned an awful lot. It was, you know, it was a wonderful experience. I think I saw a hand in the back. No? Anybody else on the no. zooming in? I know you got to uh, get on the road again, so I just want to say thank you so much. My my that. pleasure. Yes. Thanks for having me. And I'll sign books, obviously. Um, yeah. Golf or ball legal. <laughs> uh, thank you.